We have two scripture passages this morning. The first one is from Philippians chapter 3, verses 7 to 14. Philippians chapter 3, verse 7 to 14. Gain to me, these I have counted loss for Christ. Yet indeed I also count all things loss for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them as rubbish, that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith, that I may know him, the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering, being conformed to his death, if by any means I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already attained or am already perfected, but I press on, that I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has also laid hold of me. Brethren, I do not count myself to, app to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind, and reaching forward to those things which are ahead, I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. And from Revelation 21, 1 to 7. Description of a vision given to, to the Apostle John. Now I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, also there was no more sea. Then I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former, former things have passed away. Then he who sat on the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said to me, Write these words. Write, for these words are faithful and true. And he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and Omega beginning and the end. I will give of the fountain of the water of life freely to him who thirsts. Amen. This is the word of God. Let's read that last verse together. <laughs> he who overcomes <laughs> shall inherit <laughs> all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. <clears throat> A long, long running, sometimes morally questionable, <laughs> but smartly written television comedy came to an end this past week. Some of you saw it. It made a big bang. Uh, the Big Bang Theory, uh, very popular with many, not so popular with a few others, uh, but a viewership of almost 13 million viewers per episode wrapped up this past week after about a 12 year run. There's been a lot of advertising buildup for the final show. And so, your pastor, <laughs> along with many millions of other viewers, succumbed to his curiosity. How are they going to wrap this thing up? I'm not going to ask for a show of hands how many of you watched it. Uh, some of you saw it this past week. Perhaps if you did, you were pleasantly surprised, as I was, by the ending. Uh, without getting into details, in case some of you don't want to see it, it ended with an honest and heartfelt expression of genuine love. Didn't it? Coming from someone more typically prone to selfishness, self-centeredness. It was a good ending, I thought even refreshing. It was interesting, uh, never did I think I would get an illustration for a sermon out of Revelation from the Big Bang Theory. Uh, <laughs> however, however, it was interesting.
interesting uh, in light of some of what I've been thinking about this week as we finish up our final message on in the story from Revelation. And by the way, if someone ever asks you to write a message about 20, 25 minutes long covering the whole book of Revelation, don't even attempt it. It's just too hard. Uh, but I got, I was impressed with this ending because really in some ways it hit that theme which I want to hit today, which is love triumphant over self-centeredness and pride, even sin. It was an interesting ending in light of uh, this much more important storyline that we've been following for some time now. And let me suggest that this more important unfolding story is one that we are all involved in. It's not just been a, a distant study, an intellectual study of a passage of scripture or, or the Bible itself. It's been a story, and I hope you found this as we've moved through it, that you and I are very much involved in. It's our story. It's connected with our hearts. It's connected with our joys, our celebrations, but also our shortcomings and our sins, our idol worship, our returning again to those uh, things that we know will not satisfy, but then again being restored uh, to our God and worship of our God, and then falling again through that Old Testament again and again, didn't we? We rose and we fell, and we rose and we fell, and then finally as we hit the New Testament, God's incredible gift to us, which we could not earn even in his son, gift of love, gift of mercy, as Jesus went to the cross for us. And we again affirm together, placing our hope and our faith in this great salvation that has been won for us. I want to suggest that hopefully the, this theme of love triumphant over sin, love triumphant over pride and selfishness is not just the outcome of Big Bang Theory or even the outcome of the Word of God, but it is your outcome. Love triumphant over sin and self-centeredness. The final book of the Bible is a rich, profound, at times difficult to understand revelation from God. Agreed? It's given in a vision to the Apostle John late in his life while living on the island of Patmos. It is likely that John was living in either imposed or maybe even self-imposed exile at a time when Rome ruled Asia and was particularly violently hostile to Christianity. And the vision came to John and was given to the church of his day at a time of incredible persecution, when the threat of suffering and even dying for the cause of Christ was very real. This was a time when they needed to hear and be reminded that victory was theirs. God's victory was theirs. Love, the love they'd seen in Jesus, the love they'd heard about in Jesus, would triumph even in these devastating, horrible times. As uh, commentator F.F. F. Bruce puts it in his commentary on Revelation, one of his commentaries, he said, Jesus, not Caesar, is the one to whom all power is given. Jesus, not Caesar, is the Lord of history. And in his sovereignty and triumph, his faithful followers share already, and in anticipation, will share fully at the parousia, at the return of Christ. The early church needed to be encouraged to remain faithful at a time when it may not have seemed clear to them who was in control, who was in charge, who had authority as history unfolded. Did it really matter if they remained faithful? Even as basic as is God real? Or is Jesus real? These questions were real to them. And folks, though times are very different, 
These questions are not far from us. Who's in charge? Who has authority as history unfolds? Does it really matter if I remain faithful? Is there hope? Is God real? Is Jesus real? The vision given to John was a needed message for believers in John's day and in ours. Confirmation that the worldly authorities around us are ultimately subject and accountable to God. The world authorities around us are ultimately <laughs> subject and accountable to God. And the godless, godlessness that they saw around them, the godlessness that we may see around us, though at some times seeming to go unchecked, at times seeming to thrive, will one day need to be reckoned with. There will be a day of accountability, and Revelation is clear on that, isn't it? It's clear on that. There are many encouragements in Revelation, but there are also strong warnings, words of correction and discipline. There is clear indication in the vision given to John that yes, Jesus will come again, even as his disciples, disciples were told. We heard that in our children's story when he ascended into heaven. Look, why are you standing and watching? He will come again just as he went. A second coming. Look, we read in Revelation chapter 1, he is coming with the clouds. John sees this in his vision. He is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who have pierced him. We see clearly in John's vision that there will be a time of tribulation, a time of suffering ahead. And there will be a judgment day for all. Revelation shows us from God the hard truth that there is eternal suffering and separation from God for those who have rejected God, who have rejected Christ, and failed to serve him. At the end of Revelation, it tells us that there will be punishment for anyone who adds to this revelation or anyone who takes away from it. And there are parts, truthfully, when we read it, we'd love to take away. But it's there. Then I saw a great white throne, and him who was seated on it, the earth and the, heaven, and the heavens fled from his presence, and there was no place for them. A little later, each person was judged according to what they had done. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. The lake of fire is the second death. Anyone whose name was not found written in the book of life was thrown into the lake of fire. My microphone. Sometimes asked, should I move that microphone over? Okay. I'm sometimes asked when we talk about things like the lake of fire, the book of life, sometimes asked whether that's literal or symbolic. Thank you, George. 
was a comedy show called The Big Bang. <laughs> Whether the Book of Life is a real book, whether it's a symbolic book, it is a record on God's part of who knows him and loves him, not because they are worthy, but because they have received the grace and mercy, forgiveness, and love of God. Amen? Amen. I, I know the way to have my name written there, and it is to bow before Jesus, the Son of God. There is no other, no other name under heaven given to men by We are in need of salvation. We're in need of God's grace. Our sin is a problem for us. But God has given us by his grace his solution. His salvation. He's given us Jesus and he is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He is the King of kings. And I bow before him and receive the gift of forgiveness. I will serve him as Lord until I go to be with him. Laura, I was just remembering our conversation in the car yesterday. I don't know why she asked me where I wanted to be buried. <laughs> Something's coming. <laughs> we had a lot of time. We covered a lot of time. But I want to serve the Lord until that time. <clears throat> I understand how to get a wonderful celebration for your sister. It's possible. I want to fully experience life in Christ. And I've experienced that in part now, as many of you have. But I want to experience it, it in full. I want to experience face to face and in full perfect love of God. And that's not symbolic. That's a clear promise. Will you join me there? Through John, the Holy Spirit reveals his word to strengthen and encourage the church. The bride of Christ. Revelation 21, verse 2, refers to the church, the glorified Christian community, as the bride, gloriously prepared. How have we been prepared? By Christ, by his grace. Gloriously prepared, beautifully dressed in white robes for her husband, Jesus Christ. Revelation is ultimately a love story. It's a hard story. But it's, at times, but it's ultimately a love story. The story of a wedding. The story of a feast that's coming. A wedding feast. The story of an eternal relationship of love made possible by God. We are only reunited, again I'll say that, we are only reunited with our God through the preparation of grace. It is only because of God's mercy and love that we are clothed in righteousness. God, John's vision given to him from God in the strongest way possible is, I believe, God's powerful encouragement to the church in pagan times, in secular times. Encouragement to remain faithful to God. So hear that message today. Remain faithful to God. Remain faithful to him until the end. And if you're not in a relationship with God through Christ, come to him now. Come to him today. Accept his gift of forgiveness, his cleansing of sin. Accept him as Savior, but also as Lord, as ruler in your life. Because my guess is you know, as I have known, uh, that when I do it on my own, when I'm in charge, when I'm king, when I'm Lord, it doesn't look all that great. And it won't turn out all that well. Accept him as Lord. And then remain faithful to the end. There is specific encouragement to the church. I'm going to go on just for a little, a little bit more today. It's a, it's a, there's a lot of themes in this book, so we're, we're moving through. There are a lot of themes in this book. Uh, part of 
what God does through John is give specific encouragements to the church. Sometimes words of encouragement continue doing this, or, or stop doing this, or return to doing this, return to your first love. But always repent, confess sin, turn from sin, and listen to what the Spirit says to the churches. We could do a great, and I think we have once or twice done a great seven-part sermon series on the letters to the churches given to John, and then given to the churches. God wants the church to be in vital, close relationship with him. And anything that pulls us away as a church, anything that pulls us away personally, we need to repent of and turn back to him. God wants that close relationship with us. At the end of those letters to the church, you know what it says there. It says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. Open the door to me. Birch Cove Baptist Church, open the door today again to Christ. Open the door to the Lord. The door to your heart, the door to your real life, and I will come in. It's a prayer, isn't it? Lord, come in again to my life. Renew me. That's a daily prayer for me. I don't know about you. Come in, Lord, and renew me. Continue to do your work in me. I will come in, Jesus says, and I will eat with you. I will have fellowship with you in rich relationship. God wants us to not give up, to continue faithfully to the end, because the reward, the prize, is coming. Like Paul, John, as he passes on this revelation, is calling us to run the race in such a way as to win the prize. I've told you before, although many of you look at me and you just can't believe it, that I used to run marathons when I was younger. But I remember a couple of marathons in Ottawa when I used to run them. I remember in particular, the whole thing was hard, but I remember in particular the last six miles especially. Uh, the Heartbreak Hill leading up to the Parliament buildings. Some of you have been there uh, along the Ottawa River and then that slow ascent after 20 miles, just a steady climb up to Parliament Hill. Exhausting. Why did I do this? <laughs> Should I just quit now? What was I thinking? And then uh, a little bit more of an exhausting run, flat along the Rideau Canal, but still exhausting, the last six miles. And some of those same thoughts, I don't know if I can do this, I don't know if I can go keep on till the end. But then you start to hear something. You know what it is? Cheering. The cheering. You start to hear the cheering. You start to hear those hundreds, even thousands of people at Carleton University, which is at that time where the ending of the race was. And your stride gets a little bit stronger and you straighten up a little bit so you don't look quite so pathetic as you come across the line. And you just have added strength because of the encouragement of others to finish the race. God wants to encourage you. As we close this story, we already said it though, the story isn't done, is it? Nowhere near done. It's an eternal story continues on in life, in you and in me, but it continues beyond this life. And God tells us about the prize, tells us about the finish line, and what, what the prize is. The description of God's finish line for believers is probably the most beautiful part of John's vision, along with the many other pictures of heavenly worship throughout Revelation. It is the description of heaven and eternity with God. Reward at the close of the race. I think in Ottawa I have a t-shirt. And my beautiful wife waiting at the end. That was a beautiful reward. You weren't my wife at that point, were you? Well, I knew you would. <laughs> the ultimate reward, the heavenly reward, is described in to it already, a perfect love, perfect life, perfect joy, perfect blessing. Sin and death will be no more. Don't let those words go by really quick. Sin and death will be no more. 
Instead of a curse because of disobedience in eating from the tree of life, we will, by God's grace, be invited to eat from the tree of life. Blessed are those who have washed their robes, that they may now have the right to the tree of life. There will be perfect healing. Some of you today who are aching a little bit, there's a few of us aching, some in our hearts, some in our bodies, some in our spirits. There will be perfect healing. The separation and division we've experienced with God and sometimes in our relationships, and there are challenges for us, all of us in relationships, and certainly at times in our relationship with God. The separation and division we have experienced because of sin and pride will be replaced by perfect unity and perfect fellowship. The dwelling of God will be with men, with men and women, and he will live with them. We will be his people, and he will be our God. There is an intimacy restored. The intimacy we, intimacy we began the story with in the garden will be restored. He will wipe away every tear. There will be no more crying, no more pain. The old order of things will pass away. He who is seated on the throne will say, Behold, I am making everything new. Isn't that awesome? Be encouraged. Run the race. Continually return to God. Continually confess and repent. Invite him in when he knocks. Invite him in. And serve him as Savior and Lord until the end. Love wins. God wins of God, because of his mercy, we win as we believe. Love is triumphant over sin, over pride and self-centeredness. Amen. Let's pray. God, I thank you for revealing yourself, yourself to us. I thank you for revealing your upper story will to us. And I thank you for coming to meet us in our story, our lower story. Father, thank you for your grace and your mercy in your Son, Jesus Christ. Lord, lead us forward as a church, as individuals. May we be found faithful. May we be found prayerful, inviting you in day by day, turning from our sin, honoring you in our lives until you return. And Father, we look forward to the reward across that finish line. We celebrate it for those who have gone on before us, but Lord, we, cel we will celebrate it, each one who's placed their faith in Christ whether we come to meet you at the end of our life here or when you return. Lord, Heavenly Father, thank you. We praise you that your love is triumphant. In Jesus' name we pray, and through Jesus we pray. Amen. Let's sing.